Are there any questions? Please. There may only be one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. David Lambert. Uh, I believe the scientific community is in agreement that climate change is it's real, it's here, and it's devastating. And yet Secretary Glickman said a poll last week reflected that 40 percent of respondents still believe climate change is a hoax. Would you comment on the consequences of climate change and, and, and specifically how we more effectively sell this message to policymakers on the importance of responding to it? Well, I think, I think that, that, well, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about what's, what's happening and what impact climate change is going to have. But I think we've seen enough now. We have enough, as you say, scientific evidence to show that, for one thing, we're going to have very important price volatilities resulting from production volatilities caused by extreme weather. I mean, I, I don't, I, this has been going on for, for too long to be kind of just a blip. This is going to be with us. Um, eventually, the production patterns are going to shift from probably m from the tropical to the subtropical, uh, and Denmark is going to be the preferred place for you to go and s sunbathe in January uh, as the as the global warming uh, increases. So th those those two things I think are, are very 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 clear. How fast is this going to happen? Uh, my concern right now is on the fluctuations, it's on the, on the extreme weather patterns, because that's something we have to deal with now. The, the temperature is going up, but very, very slowly. <coughs> and <coughs> and we, have time <coughs> we have time to deal with this, but of course we have to start now. Uh, how do we convince policymakers who don't think that we have a, a, a global warming, and who, some who don't think that we have anything to do with it, we as human beings? Uh, I really don't know. Um, what we, my experience, if, if you have a good idea you want a policymaker to consider, whether it's climate change or, or <coughs> food security or whatever, it, <coughs> there has to be something in there for the policymaker. It goes back to the stakeholder, stakeholder analysis. You cannot assume that the policymaker will accept the first best policy solution from an efficiency point of view. If you were to do it this way, it would be least, it would be as, as, as inexpensive as possible. And uh, <coughs> this is only water, right? Yes. <coughs> okay. <laughs> I know Klaus, he's a, he's a practical yoga, but not today. So um, there has to be something in it for the, the stakeholders that have the power to do something about it. And I think what's happening in the United States right now is it's not, we, we are not, the, many of the policymakers <coughs> or the, the people who, <coughs> who are participating in the debate um, don't necessarily see the urgency in this. Maybe they will 20 years, uh, 20, yeah, 20 years from now, but then it may be a bit late. I haven't answered your question because I don't think I can. Uh, here comes Mr. Climate Change. <laughs> Fair. Thanks for the presentation. Um, one comment on the slide that you had from IFPRI. We call those things these days, we call them scenarios, neither projections nor predictions, because okay. what they are is um, some plausible, plausible, mind you, drivers, that then these are the outcomes of those plausible drivers. And so different combinations will give you different outcomes, and so then these are potential futures depending upon a whole lot of things. So, But the, the question I was going to come back to was actually more one we, and and you said we need to do this uh, you know find out the stakeholders and, and I think that's a good first step to figure out who it is that's actually involved in influencing the policymaker and making the decisions happen um, and we don't do enough but, but once you find out who they are then what do we do in this room this community or should we go talk to each one of those folks should we um, I mean, target our messages to individual groups in that community. You know, what are your suggestions on that end? My, <coughs> my suggestion is that if we understand the, who the stakeholders are and their relative power and, of course, their agenda, we can present options that are more likely to be accepted in the debate that the stakeholders are eventually going to have. Now, 
if you're asking what can IFPRI do about this, that's much more difficult because a lot of this is, is context specific. So it seems to me that what IFPRI can do is to set up a system by which national researchers or national advisors to government can, can develop options that are likely to be politically feasible. What, what I'm, uh, the straw man I'm fighting uh, I'm, uh, here, uh, maybe it isn't a straw man, is that as an economist, I want the government to do what is most efficient to achieve the goal that the government has set. And as long as I take that perspective, I may not develop the options that are viable. So therefore the government won't take the option that I think the government should take uh, not because the government is stupid, but because it's it's not politically feasible. So I think if we can just, as we develop our policy options, think about how is this going to play out in a debate among stakeholders. And by stakeholder groups, I'm of course talking about lobbying groups, those who have an interest in the outcome. I think that's probably all we can do. But we haven't had nearly enough debate in the research community, in the policy research community, it seems to me, as to how we get there. And you know as well as I do that many of our recommend, or if we don't give recommendations, I guess, but many of the options we develop uh, are not accepted because we fail to understand the politics. Does that, do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? So do I. Good. Are there any further questions? Thank you very much. My name is Thomas Schmidt and I'm from the Embassy of Germany. Um, I, I think we all agree that uh, improvements in productivity of farmers is a very important uh, objective. And I would like to know what you think about the role of biotechnology and especially genetically modified plant varieties. Thank you. Well, I have uh, written extensively about this, so I'm, I suspect that you're just setting me up here, uh, <laughs> which is fine. I'll be glad to express my, my position on that again. Um, I, I think we need to, you, first of all, I want, I want to emphasize that farmers can expand their productivity with the current technology if the external uh, constraints are removed. Having said that, yes, we need to do more research to help farmers increase the productivity and reduce the unfarm losses to insects and, and diseases and droughts and so on. There, I think we need to use the best signs we have. And in some cases, it is the kind of science that's embodied in an agroecological approach or even an organic production approach. In other cases, the problems can only be solved by using molecular biology. And part of molecular biology that's needed may well be transgenic. I do not believe that we should in any way influence developing country policymakers in the direction that somehow using transgenic approaches in agricultural research is wrong. If the Europeans, if we don't want to, to use it, that's fine. Uh, but I don't think we should tell developing countries that they shouldn't use it because we don't know, we, I don't have any evidence that this is any more risky than what is called traditional plant breeding, which of course is not traditional anymore. Um, so I, that my position is let each country decide for itself what kind of research portfolio it wants to have. And if it doesn't want a transgenic approach, uh, it's, it's their decision. The problem is that we from Europe and many of the non-governmental organizations, including Greenpeace and others, are putting at least implicit pressure on developing country decision makers not to adopt um, varieties that are genetically modified and not to do research on transgenic, uh, using transgenic methods. I think that's ethically wrong. And if you can kind of turn this around and say, suppose we in Europe have a meeting about how to deal with 
demen dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease. And a delegation from Africa were to come and say, if you're going to solve that problem, you have to do it without using genetic engineering. You can't use transgenic methods. We wouldn't, it wouldn't take us very long to kick them out. I'm afraid we're doing some of that, at least implicitly. But you knew I was going to say that. <laughs> Are there further questions? Suresh, I see, and I haven't forgotten you. Suresh. Oh, you have the micro. Why don't you start? Well, Pierre, I have uh, two questions I'll ask, but I have more questions. Uh -oh. The first question is about your recommendation of reducing stock buildup. I don't know if you have been following it up, but countries after countries are jumping on the bandwagon of idea that increasing stock is a solution to yes. dealing with food crisis. Yes. To give you some examples, Ethiopia has decided to increase its stock from 500,000 tons, actually less than that, to 3 million tons. Right. Kenya has already doubled from 340 to 780. Uh, Malawi has doubled. Bangladesh is considering from 650,000 to 3 million tons. Right. If you were here still as the Director General of IPRI, what would you have recommended us to do in that context? That's my first question. Second question is, in your presentation, uh, studying IPRI from the college, I thought the safety net would be an important aspect of dealing with food security. In your presentation, I haven't seen you mention that. So does that mean that in Pierre Pinstrunk world, safety net, social safety net has been relegated? Thank you. No, absolutely not. When, uh, I, there was a limit to how much uh, detail I could, I could put in in the, uh, in the time I had. Uh, when I talked about these short-term policy interventions, that would include safety nets. Absolutely it would. But it's primarily safety nets from the middle, to, uh, from the poor, uh, poor to middle income urban consumers. That's what I was referring to. I didn't use the word, say, the word safety net, but that would be part of it. It's transfers in, in various kinds. No, absolutely that's part of, uh, part of the portfolio I think governments need to follow to protect their poor people. I would like to see some of those safety nets uh, reach the real poor people rather than those who take to the streets and, and smash cars. But that's a, that's a political economy issue as well. Um, it's very expensive to hold physical, a physical stock of grain. Um, I don't, um, in, in fact, the, the, worst, the worst it seems to me you can do is to, is to build up your stock when the prices are going up. And, and that is, in fact, what was happening up until a few months ago. Uh, that because uh, so many countries were holding back uh, on stock, the prices would not kind of, they kept going up for, for purely artificial reasons uh, in the sense that it wasn't a supply demand question at the global level. It was a, a question of how much of that was being released uh, to the market and how much was being put away. But, but it's even worse than that, it seems to me. Many countries are now talking about self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is extremely expensive uh, if you don't have the uh, ecological environment to grow the particular food. Uh, but you saw that um, this may change now that prices are beginning to come down, but you saw that in, uh, in the beginning and the middle of 2008, there was a lot of discussion about self-sufficiency. And that is extremely expensive for those countries who don't have the environment to do it. So my, um, you asked me what would I do if I was still at IFPRI, what, what, what recommendation? IFPRI doesn't give recommendations as far as I know unless it has changed since I left. Um, so, but what I, what I would suggest would be to depend much more on trade and much less on self-sufficiency. Now, you have a problem with the landlocked countries such as Malawi, and you mentioned Malawi, that the uh, export and import parity prices are very different. So it may well be that landlocked countries should have a small reserve fund, but uh, a reserve stock. But, but there are so many problems associated with that. One, of course, is that the rats tend to be smarter than the humans, so they'll get in there and take care of some of it. It, it does tend to, we do tend to develop uh, microtoxins in, in some of the grain that's, uh, that's in storage. Uh, who is going to release the grain? When is it going to be released? Is it the Minister of Agriculture's cousin that's going to decide when this is going to be released? and so on. So it's a, it's a tough one to manage. But I do agree with you that for the, 
Landlocked countries that have a large difference between import and export parity price, uh, you may want to hold a small amount of stock. That would, that would be what I would say. consequences of having big stock, what would you have recommended? Uh, not recommended, suggested. The consequences... Uh, holding really large stock, as you have pointed well, out. Uh, yeah, that's what I just said. It, it's very expensive. You're going to lose a lot of it. You're going to have a political problem deciding when to release it, and uh, who's, who is going to benefit from this. You, you have a, basically an open book for corruption in that kind of situation. Not that anybody in Malawi would be corrupt, but I'm just using that as, an, as a hypothetical example. Yeah, can you embark a little bit more on the media? Because when we had, beginning this year, when the wildfires in Russia were, there was tremendous pressure on, on IFPRI and saying, yes, that could endanger the whole world situation mm -hmm. on wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, the market fundamentals were speaking totally against that. Right. Uh, but the pressure on the institute, you know, the media, are you not thinking that, and it will harm the poor, etc.? So I think we should also maybe do some more research into what makes government officials tick. Because if I'm sitting somewhere in a, in a country and I get the pressure from the media, you know, are, are you selling out this country? Uh, will we suffer soon? Then, then most probably I would act too. I'm glad you raised that question because even though I've been away from, from IFRI now for, what, almost nine years, um, I, I'm absolutely convinced that these governments, more than, more than before, because IFRI is much bigger and, and does many more things, is looking to IFRI for an objective assessment of the situation. And if IFRI jumps on the bandwagon of saying, let's exploit the, the uh, wheat uh, uh, situation in Russia in order that we can get more money, then you lose credibility. I haven't seen if we do that, no. but there's a risk. There's a risk of jumping on that uh, because we all have to kind of raise money. D does that get at what you were saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I think no, so. You, no, you also said should we do some research on on seeing what makes policymakers tick? Absolutely, we should. That that whole policy process. I'm uh, the, uh, the principal investigator of a project. Uh, where we uh, have uh, researchers from 17 developing countries, um, each doing a country study of the policy process as it relates to the food price changes. Mm -hmm. And hopefully out of that set of country studies will come some synthesis work and we will be a, in, a, in a better position to try to answer your question. Uh, but yeah, we need a lot more evidence to understand the process. Suresh, you had your hand up. Uh, uh, thank you, Klaus. Uh, Suresh Babu from IFPRI. Uh, Bear, I have a comment and, and a couple of questions. The comment is thank you for writing that book. And that uh, book really lays out all the kind of concepts and thematic issues that uh, you try to present today. But uh, it has a lot more in terms of uh, where we can take that and actually use it in many developed and developing country universities as a, a book that can be taught for a course in this, in this issues. Thank you for doing that. My questions uh, relate to, you talked about governments and the media. You didn't talk about the responsibility of the researchers and policy advisors. Did I miss that or you didn't want to talk about that? What we should have done in the early part of 2007, for example, uh, with the experience we have had before. I mean, you talked about the 95, 96. We said at that time it was just, just a blimp and it was, it was. And, and did we learn anything from in the last 20 years that we could have used to advise the governments that went against, for example, the export ban and so on. That's one. The second is uh, this international agricultural research system is going through a change. And in the context of food crisis, in the context of what you have presented today, what should we be doing differently or what advice you would have? You have headed the organizations and you have been chair of the Science Council. Do you see anything that we should be doing differently in the next five to 10 years? In agriculture research specifically. Yes. Well, let me, let me address that one first. I think agriculture research uh, priorities should reflect the uh, dramatic uh, volatility that we have in production and in prices. And that means drought tolerance. It means, well, it means biotic and abiotic stresses uh, to, to deal with those things. That's not new in the sense that that is part of the portfolio at present. But I think we need to pay a lot more attention uh, to 
uh, how farmers can deal with the, with the volatility. And there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, since I'm an economist, I think risk management is, is of critical importance, but obviously agricultural research is important as well. Um, I forgot what your first question was in the meantime. What, uh, as researchers, you mentioned about governments and... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, look, um, can anybody predict what the food prices are going to be a year from now uh, when you have this kind of volatility? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure if we could have done anything different. It would be nice if IFPRI had a crystal ball that was stronger than the one you have, but I don't know that that exists. Uh, if you had gone in, say, in, uh, if IFPRI had gone in, say, in 2002, 2003, and saying, look, this is the beginning of an increasing price trend. Governments, you better deal with this before it gets out of hand. But I don't think, I certainly couldn't see in 2002 that this was what was going to happen over the next uh, eight years. So I'm not sure you could have done anything different. And I want to repeat what I, what I said when, when Klaus has his question. If we are seen as a credible source of knowledge in food policy, don't change that because it's one of the few or maybe the only one that, or certainly the one that it has the most credibility right now seems to me. And I'm not saying that just because I'm at IFPRI. No further questions? Oh, one here, you. Thank you. Um, I'm Eric Luftman from the State Department. Um, first to comment on uh, your views on the media. Um, I, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't agree with, with uh, holding the media at fault for the way it uh, dealt with the crisis in 2007, 2008. Um, th as you just described, uh, experts were unable to predict what, what was going to happen. Obviously, the media reports on, on major crises and responds. It doesn't cover things, it doesn't cover food prices when food prices are stable, but it, it may find a good story when, when something dramatic is happening in food prices. And uh, journalists are looking for explanations, and it's really the responsibility of experts like IFPRI and, and, and others to help the media interpret that and to try to tamp down any uh, extreme views and you know, uh, panic that may result from, from uh, media reports. So that's, I think that addresses the question that was raised before about what's the responsibility of organizations like this. Even if you can't really anticipate where prices are going, you, you do have a responsibility to explain um, th that uh, things are not always as critical as they may seem. Uh, and totally unrelated to that now, I, I had a question regarding um, uh, post-harvest losses because you identified that as something that uh, is an important area for uh, helping reduce um, price increases. That was an interesting what. It, I, I'm curious what the how is on actually um, reducing post-harvest losses what governments can do to help that, for example. Um, what I'm worried about regarding the news media is not that they report what's happening. What worries me is they predict what is likely to happen. And they have no qualifications to do that. And that is why they frequently end up promoting misallocation of resources. Because some of the articles, to be as sensational as possible, were not just saying food prices went up yesterday and they're going up today. They said tomorrow it's going to be even worse. And two years from now, we're going to run out of food. So you better go and hoard your food. Better run to the supermarket. That's the kind of behavior I, I don't like. And I'm not an expert on, on the media. But I could see what impact that had when they sensationalized. So I think there's a very clear difference between reporting the facts to the best of our ability. That's very different from predicting. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm worried about the news media. But they will do it again. Next time, next time uh, the Russian wheat field burned, it will be the same story, I'm afraid. So, so that's, my, that's my concern on them. Um, that's my concern on that one. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer to your second question, the how question. This is something we need to think a lot more about, how to actually do that. 
As someone <coughs> who is all, always under tremendous stress when the price prices go up or down as Maximo Torero. Maximo, would you like to, to say something? Because you're the first one to meet the media then. <laughs> Do we have a microphone? No, only to, to support what, what has been said about the media. Uh, we did a systematic analysis of, of the media. Uh, it's in the Hunger Index. There is a table there and, and we are launching a, a tool that looks at media since early 2000. And, and the point was to, to analyze uh, when the media was saying the price should go up and all the reasons behind, and to look to real facts attached to it. And for example, in the Russian crisis, in the fires and so on, we clearly found that there was an enormous exaggeration to what should have happened in reality, and, and that's all documented. So, so the, the, as Pierre was saying, the problem is that uh, positions are taken and there is a lot of selection in who they interview to be able to, to get what they want, uh, and that's a, a crucial problem. Uh, uh, if it was completely in the opposite situation in the case of the Russian, uh, and we clearly came up substantially saying prices were going down, and prices went, went down immediately. Right. That, that's one. And my question to you, Pierre, <laughs> you, you started your presentation saying that it's a given that we need to look at the smallholders. And I am not so convinced about it. Uh, to resolve, I, I am convinced if you want to target poverty and reduce poverty, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but I'm not so convinced if you want to look at food, se food security. So. I just want to open that, that ring. I think, it, I, th I think it's very important that we focus on the rural poor, and most of them have uh, fallen in the category of, of a smallholder, at least in Africa, they do not in South Asia. So as an as a intended beneficiary, I think we do need to have the focus if we're interested in poverty alleviation and hunger alleviation. Um, the question you're raising, of course, is, is, a, is a hot one, and it's, it's hotly debated right now. Uh, if we're looking at Africa, for example, uh, should um, African agriculture um, develop into larger commercial units, because the smallholders are never really going to be able to produce the kind of food that's needed. Uh, it's going to be very, the post-harvest expenditures, the post-harvest post costs are very high, you have to go and assemble um, uh, the, the output in many different farms and so on. Wouldn't it be much better we have big chunks of, of land um, and, and then we could reduce the, the post-harvest uh, post um, uh, costs. Uh, and land grabbing could come in there as a very nice thing because you could get the, uh, the um, Croatian government to put some investment into uh, a 10,000 uh, hectare farm and, and you would put in all your equipment, you produce a lot of food. So the question, as, as I see it, um, is really whether the goal is to um, expand global food production or the goal is to reduce uh, food, household food insecurity, hunger, and malnutrition. If it's the former, it may well be that large commercial, uh, large-scale commercial farming could become more efficient if uh, the interest rates are low. And the interest rates are very low for the people that come in from the outside, whether they're Croatian or from Saudi Arabia or some multinational corporation. So when, you're, when your capital is cheap relative to your labor, as it is in the United States and could be in an artificial situation, say in Ethiopia, of the kind I just described, then you may well be able to uh, increase production uh, faster and more than you can on small farms. But with the current capital uh, labor uh, price ratios, uh, small farmers, as you know, are just as efficient as larger farmers. Uh, it's the post-harvest costs that differ. Um, so I, again, I, I think it's really a matter of what are we trying to achieve here. We have loads of food in this world. There's no shortage of food. Uh, there is a shortage of, of, of ability to get access to the food. And unless we focus on that second part, we're going to end up with, with much more food than we know what to do with, simply because the demand, uh, the demand is not, or the, the needs are not translated into demand. So that's why I think the smallholders should still be in the focus, not as the actor, not as the policy actor, but as the beneficiary. But it's something maybe we should discuss more over a cup of tea sometime. Because it is a hot, hotly debated issue, as, as you know. Take the last two. Shall I, 
I'm Jacob Kain, a former director for research at the International Water Management Institute. Per, you mentioned that there is still land available. And of course, one of the external constraints in reducing the yield gap is the availability of water. Yeah. And in many countries, although the um, regional climate change models are not precise enough to really pinpoint how the effect of climate change will work out, the prediction or the expectation is that some of the areas which are now rain-fed agricultural production areas will go out of production because the rain will be too variable and too volatile to really have reliable yields. I've been recently somewhat involved in a project in South Africa and there the competition for water is huge, as you mentioned, between the um, needs for industrial development, power generation, and for agriculture, and the irrigated agriculture, small-scale irrigated agriculture in the northwest of South Africa is not very productive at all. And the fear is that that water will not be used for irrigation in another 10 years, but will all be used. So I wonder whether in our models and in our policies, there is any way in which we can also anticipate these rather large-scale changes in land that is currently under agriculture, but is possibly, probably, going out of production. Yes, and a lot, of course, will depend on what does happen to, to um, uh, rainfall patterns. Absolutely, I agree with you. And there will be some, as, as global warming um, <coughs> stays with us, there will be some areas where, where production probably not, is not uh, useful. I, I think if we, if we think a bit more into the future, uh, I have this uh, crazy idea that at some future point in time, we can actually justify desalinating seawater and, and sending it uh, through pipes uh, to at least some of the places you're mentioning. Certainly coastal areas, for sure. Yeah, it, It's kind of crazy that we are piping oil from Canada to the southern part of the United States, but we can't pipe uh, water anywhere but uh, t from one household to a, to a local uh, source. Um, but that's just the way it is. And, and the question is, uh, is, is there going to be a point where, where we can justify economically using uh, seawater, uh, the salinated, uh, desalinated seawater? And it doesn't answer your question. Yes, there will be some areas, I'm sure, that will go out of production. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Kim Yutin from Korean Embassy, dealing with our cultural bilateral matters. Uh, Yorick says, says something about uh, domestic market policies, which I haven't read yet. Uh, I think that the price mechanism is the most important factor in dealing with food security matters in the world. But uh, everything uh, happens at local level. So I think that the for policy makers, how to reduce the gap between uh, farmers receiving a uh, price and consumer paying price are most important factors. So probably your books dealing with that matter in uh, chapter six. Can you tell us a little bit about that, particularly how we uh, develop and improve uh, distribution channel and how we create the local agricultural market? Thank you very much. Well, I think in, in the, I can only speak in, in a general sense because it is the solutions are very context specific. But I think in the general sense, um, the the uh, infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of institutions, the lack of a domestic market uh, functioning effectively, uh, those will be the, the things that uh, I think most countries would look at. Um, I I don't think the price is the most important factor to increase productivity on small farms if we don't do anything else. If we increase the price, um, because the supply elasticity, the total supply elasticity uh, on small farms tend to be very low. The farmer, wh what, is, what is the farmer going to do if the price goes up by 20%? Uh, put in a little more labor? Well, that may not have much effect. Uh, buy fertilizers? It's probably still way too expensive to get it in there. Um, improve the markets? No, the farmer can't do this. So I think, again, and I know I'm, I sound like a broken record here, but I think if, unless we deal with those, uh, those constraints outside the farm, increasing the food price is probably not going to increase productivity very much. It will increase the price that the consumer pays, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we have one last gentleman. 
I liked your presentation very much because you looked at food and you looked at natural resources management and you sound a very different pair from the one I knew before. And uh, is it better or worse? The, uh, better one. It's a better one. <laughs> now I think uh, the, my question is about your last uh, recommendation about international institutions improvement. I like that very much because most of the things that are now a problem of one country are actually coming from other countries. A good example of the cows in Denmark that you talked about. The solution to that are, um, depends on the action of the world and uh, not one country. Now, the question is this. You did not say this is a recommendation, but you said it, uh, that the, the uh, international institutions should be improved. My question is how? The UN is now 56 years old and uh, it has only had modest improvement. We only now have one, uh, two superpower, which is the US, and that's the one which has the big army. Uh, so how are we going to improve this? How are the international institutions going to be improved? I, um, I teach a course at Cornell on how globalization affects poverty, and the question you just raised is the question that comes up in almost every class. Um, first of all, bad national policy is not going to be rectified by having good international institutions. We have learned that over the years. So unless countries sort out their own business, the international institutions are not going to help them very much. That wasn't your question, but it's an important consideration as we, as we jump on the international institutions that even if we have the most beautiful international institutions that we could imagine, a country that does not sort out its own national policies would not benefit very much. Now, how do we improve the international institutions in a power, in a, in a power, uh, power situation like the one you just described? And of course, my answer is, I don't know. Um, I think all we can really do as researchers is to point out that there is a very serious issue here that needs to be dealt with in international agreements, in international organizations. One specific recommendation I made was, and, and this is fairly simple to implement, probably uh, very difficult to actually enforce uh, the, the later on, is the question of export, of export bans and export restrictions. Um, I, I don't want to stand here and jump on, on India because uh, India uh, made a contribution to the problem, but it was only a contribution. But I think as long as countries can introduce um, beggar the neighbor policies in the sense of saying, I'm going to protect my uh, tribe even though it's going to hurt everybody else, then we don't have orderly trade. And the reason we have a, 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 a WTO is to try to have an orderly trade. We can't have an orderly trade if, if countries just do whatever they feel like doing, violating whatever rules that they have agreed to. Um, but so, so one thing that, that, that should be possible to do is to enforce the, um, the clause in the WTO that talks about export restrictions. It's a small step, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, I can't stand here and develop a new um, an international institutional framework, and I couldn't if I sat down for a week either, but, but, but I think that there is a need for those who are in power to talk about these things. But look, this country hasn't even signed the Kyoto Agreement. Chances are that the meetings that are going to take place in Durban aren't going to amount to anything either. So we are very far from having anything like international agreements on something that would be good for everybody. And I hate to leave you in a, on a pessimistic note, but it is a serious question which I don't, to which I don't have an answer. Yeah, well, it's the last person there left. A genie came into the room, and it says, Pear has three wishes free. What would they be? I told you he was a practical joker. I didn't know I was in the water. Now I'm even more worried. <laughs> it, 
if um, in my first and second and third wish is to have a whole bundle of resources that I, I could allocate to sub-Saharan African countries to improve their infrastructure so it would be as good as it is in South Asia. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Per for a stimulating presentation.